Okay, so hello everyone, good morning. Uh, today we are very happy to have Inon Spinka from UBC, who will be talking about a tale of two balloons. Please, Inon. Thank you, Nomi. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, and I, I understand that this format is coming, may be coming to an end soon, so I'm, I'm happy to have a chance uh, to, to be here in this format. So yeah, I'm going to tell you a tale about two balloons and uh, perhaps maybe um, the, the Israelis might recognize this. Um, that kind of sounds like uh, an Israeli children's book called The Tale of Five Balloons, uh, where there's a story about uh, five balloons that are given to kids and some of the balloons pop, some of them uh, fly away. So this is also going to be relevant uh, in the talk here. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Omer Angel and Gora Bray. Uh, so, so let me begin by telling you what, uh, what this process is. Uh, so we're going to work in, in, the, in, the, in the setting of a general metric space. But uh, for now, if you wish, you can just think of uh, the Euclidean plane. Uh, and we're going to be given a set of uh, initial points shown uh, here below in this example. And we imagine that these points are the centers of uh, initially deflated balloons. And as time passes, progresses, these balloons start to inflate at a constant rate of one. And they, they always, uh, keep, they're always symmetric. They always grow um, nicely as, as, as balls, simply. Okay, so after some small amount of time, uh, these balloons will look like this. They all have the same radius um, as, as the best I could draw. And inevitably, at some point in time, these, these two balloons will uh, collide with each other. OK, so these two balloons at the bottom, they collide with each other. And then what happens is they both pop and they simply disappear. OK, so we, we simply remove these points from the process. And we continue. So, so the balloons continue to grow. And now these two balloons um, touch each other and, and they uh, they pop and, and, and annihilate with each other. Okay, and we continue in this manner. Balloons continue to grow, and as to touch each other, they um, they disappear. So you don't have new in initial balloons, right? Only the initial points that were chosen in the beginning. Yes, yes. So, okay. so this is a process of, uh, we think of this as a, pro a point process, which is changing in time, and it's just decreasing. Points are just disappearing. Nothing is actually moving. Okay, the points are in, in space and they just disappear as the balloons, as we imagine the balloons growing and, and touching each other. Exactly. So, um, so actually, it's not it just, completely just obvious. checking. In theory, within finite time, you could be left with, in theory, you could be left with nothing uh, whatsoever. I mean, that's probably zero probability, but that could happen. That's part of the, the rules allow that. Uh, well, in this generality, then, then of course, yes, that okay. could happen. But, uh, but you know, in a space like uh, like the Euclidean plane or something like that, that that won't happen. Okay, so you, we'll always have points. But, but perhaps your question is also leading to to another point: um, uh, whether this process is even well defined, and and that's not so obvious because. Um, you know, the, the moment you allow the balloons to start growing, you have infinitely many collisions and you need to make sure that this is well defined. And you need some simple, uh, some simple assumptions on the initial set of points. Uh, and I'll come back to this later, but for now, let me just mention that, that in all the cases that we're going to talk about, this will be well defined. Uh, but we'll come back to this uh, a bit later. So, okay, so the cases that I'm going to talk about today are uh, the Euclidean uh, space in any dimension, the uh, hyperbolic plane with any constant curvature, and the regular tree with any regularity. Uh, and when I talk about trees, it's going to be more convenient to, so, so a tree typically one imagines that is a discrete structure, uh, but it's going to be convenient for us to, let me choose some color here. It's going to be convenient for us to imagine this as a continuous um, space where we just identify every edge with uh, the unit interval. So the paint points are going to lie on the edges themselves. Instead, that, those are going to be the centers of the balloons. And this is just so that we don't have collisions at half integer and integer times. And we have to start breaking ties in, in some arbitrary manner. 
this is just more convenient like this to work in the exact setting I described. And the point process for us, the initial set of points is always gonna be a plus one point process. So all of these spaces that I'm discussing have a, um, have a natural map uh, measure on them. And, and this allows us to define a plus one point process. So I uh, just quickly mention for those who, who don't know, this, is, this just means that points are in, in any given region, the number of points is distributed as plus one with a mean, which is the volume of that region and uh, disjoint regions are independent. So, so this is the setting of, of the problem today. And maybe I'll just show you a simulation before we, we start. Maybe that'll also help clear any questions you might have. Um, of course, if you have questions, you're feel free to stop and ask. Uh, but let me show you a simulation starting with... Uh, 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 what is, is the density of the Parson point process? The density, that, that's the question? Uh, right. So maybe before I show the simulation. So let me mention that in the Euclidean space, it doesn't matter what intensity you take uh, because just by scaling time and space, actually this is always the same process up to some scaling. However, in the hyperbolic plane, we can either choose the curvature or the intensity of the Poisson process and up to scaling actually that, that leaves us with one real parameter. Um, and, and it's not a priori clear that, that uh, the properties of the process don't depend on that choice. Uh, so so that, that's a, a good point we should keep in mind. Um, and in the tree, it, it's, it's again, not, not so important, but, but we do have the intensity to choose from. So, so you know, uh, in the case of the trees, the balloons are always at the center of the edge, right? Uh, no, it's a, it's just a Poisson point process where the edge, oh. I, I imagine it as like unit as interval the with the bag space. measure. I see. Yeah, I see. So, so there might be three points on an interval, there might be none, and they can be sure. okay. there. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me show you the simulation in the plane. So I, I hope you guys can see something already. If not, it's going to grow in a moment. Let me press play. So these are the initial points. And as the balloons grow, um, some of them pop. We see the active balloons in blue. Uh, the balloons which popped already are shown in gray at, at the time they popped. Right, so, so as these are moving, you see things uh, pop and disappear. And at this point in time, I, I stop showing the gray and I switch us scales and I start zooming out. So the balloons are still growing, but because I'm zooming out, they, they always look like they have radius one. And, and you can see that um, maybe there's some stationary picture here. And you have a nice surprise here at the end. Okay, so um, I hope, I hope it's clear with how the process is defined. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. All right, so, so the result I, I'd like to tell you about today, well, the, what's the main question here? So, so the basic question of interest is, is that of recurrence or transients. So in, in the following sense, we'll say that the process is recurrent if almost surely every point in space is visited infinitely often by a balloon. That is for an, an unbounded set of times. And it's transient in, uh, if almost surely every point is visited only finitely often. That is a bounded set of times. And this isn't necessarily a dichotomy. Um, it's not clear. There's no, no real reason uh, a priori to just to think that these events have probability zero or one. Um, and, you know, in a general space, maybe it depends on the, on the point we're look, you're looking at. Yeah, so in terms of the points, the, um, the hyperbolic plane and the Euclidean plane, uh, Euclidean spaces, the point really shouldn't matter, right? I mean, all, the, 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 there's no difference between one point and another, but for the trees, there might well be a difference between, you know, the, the, the vertices and you know the middle you know the the, the they're not the, you know, not all points are the same in the in the world of trees right so in the trees not all points are the same and and in in the in the plane because because of transitivity transitivity all the points um look the same in distribution but it's also not obvious that in a given realization maybe you know maybe some points are visited in are are visited infinitely often and some points are not Maybe maybe these events don't have probability zero or one, uh, a priori. 
But uh, as we'll see right now, uh, the theorem that I'm going to, to tell you about is that in Euclidean space, no matter what the dimension is, uh, this process is always recurrent. And in the hyperbolic uh, plane, no matter the curvature or intensity of the Poisson process, and uh, similarly in the in the regular tree for any any degree, the process is transient. Okay, so so maybe maybe you already saw something of that uh, in the simulation. Let me also show you now a simulation in the hyperbolic plane, uh, and and I'll be doing everything in the uh, in the Poincaré disk model. Okay, so uh, again, these are um, the balloons are growing. They all have um, radius t at time t, hyperbolic radius. Um, and and it, you, you see, it looks like, um, like these balloons start to come close to the, the origin, uh, but, but eventually these are going to be popped by a, by a balloon close to the boundary. And you see, after a long time, we don't really see any active balloons in the center. So, so this is kind of hinting on tra transients, as the theorem tells us. Uh, and actually, okay, that was the end of the simulation. And actually, maybe we kind of see something more in the simulation. It looks like as time is progressing, not only do balloons not come near the center um, at, at some point, it seems like they're, they're kind of getting closer and closer to the boundary in, in the Euclidean sense. Uh, and, and indeed, this is the case. And, and to state this, let me let me give a um, a few definitions. So let's let pi sub t be um, the the point process consisting of the centers of balloons active at time t. Okay, so pi remember was the initial set of points. So pi zero is pi. And let's denote by r sub t the distance from the origin to the um, nearest center of an active balloon. Okay, so, um, so again, at time t, all the balloons have radius t, um, and rt is the distance from the origin to the nearest center. Okay, in other words, uh, rt is uh, less or equal than t, if and only if the origin is covered at time t. Okay, so, so this, um, this is the... Um, this is the scale that we care about. Um, if at time t, rt is greater or less than t. And it's not hard to check that. So, so just because of this, the limb inf of rt minus t, whether it's going to infinity or minus infinity, will determine a, a recurrence or transients. Um, and here, uh, we're going to look at something a bit coarser, the limit of rt over t. And what we see is that in the Euclidean uh, space, this limb inf is almost surely 0 which uh, let's think what that means. What that means is that not only is the origin covered infinitely often, but actually it, it comes arbitrarily close to the center of a balloon uh, re relative to its size. So at time t, it's going to be epsilon t close to the center um, infinitely often for any, any, any fixed epsilon. Uh, whereas in hyperbolic space, this limit is greater than one almost surely. Um, and, and this is the bound we get, so 1.44, uh, which, which is again that telling us that, that as time passes, balloons go near the boundary. So, yeah? what, but what I mean, it, in, in terms of hyperbolic space, that means that we have uh, most of the time we have a sort of growing hole around the origin, right? And it's growing linearly, more or less. Uh, it, yes, right. I mean, and because the origin is not special, that means that there are holes all over the hyperbolic plane growing uh, uh, linearly in time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, right, and, and the, the, um, the tree is uh, similar in, in the sense, in this respect, um, the limit, actually we know it's exactly two almost surely. Um, and and I, I, I again wanna emphasize that in the hyperbolic space and in the tree, uh, there is a real parameter, the intensity or the curvature in the hyperbolic plane, and um, although a priori the, this, the process depends on, on the curvature, uh, our lower bound here doesn't, doesn't depend and this too is also um, always holds. 
Yeah, they, they, there was a question about the the limiting distribution of this. Is it is is this just a limb in for? Can you do something about the distribution and the? We limit? we don't know anything um, quantitative really. Well, okay, we have this number here, but but in terms of the the, the probability, we don't really know anything quantitative. Uh, so um, I would guess that you know at least in the Euclidean space, uh, R T over T converges in distribution. Um, but uh, but we don't know anything quantitative. Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe before I uh, tell you about um, before I go into the proofs of these theorems, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background, including uh, that including how to see that this process is is indeed well defined. Um, okay, so so. So the, the conditions which ensure that the process is well defined, um, this follows from uh, some results in, in a paper by Holvery, Pimento, Paris, and Trem, uh, which is called Poisson matching. So they don't study this, uh, this the balloon process uh, exactly. They study uh, various types of matching on Poisson point processes. Um, but uh, as, as, I'll, as I'll mention in a moment, um, this is closely related to this process. To the balloon process, and what it what it eventually tells us is that uh, these three conditions suffice. So it's enough that the initial point process is discrete, uh, has no two pairs of points at equal distance. So you can't find two points where the distances are the same, and there's no infinite descending chain in the sense of a se an infinite sequence of points such that the consecutive distances are decreasing. So this in general suffices uh, in any metric space, in fact. Uh, and the fact that the Poisson point process satisfies these properties, uh, this, this was uh, shown initially in a paper by Hagstrom and Meester uh, in the Euclidean space. And the same types of ideas um, actually work in kind of any reasonable uh, space you can think about, including all the examples that I, I'm discussing here. So, so the hyperbolic plane and the, and, and the tree. Okay, so this, this tells us that the process is well-defined and, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about how this is relevant to our process. And this has to do with uh, stable matchings. So uh, I, perhaps a lot of you are familiar with this, uh, the theory kind of of stable matchings. In the classical setting, uh, first studied by Gill and Shapley, uh, we have uh, two, two groups, um, let's call them men and women. Uh, and each, each uh, member in each group has a preference order on the members of the other group. Okay, so every man ranks the women, every woman ranks the men. And we're looking to match a perfect, for a perfect matching between the men and women with some nice properties. Um, and for us, it's just going to be st something called a, a stable matching. So it's easier to define this through the notion of an unstable pair. Okay, so a pair of men and women, a man and a woman, say this and this, this man and this woman, is an unstable pair if on the one hand they're not currently matched to each other, but on the other hand, each of them ranks the other more preferably than the current partner that they have. Okay, so this, this man here, A, prefers a B over its current partner, A prime, and B prefers A over its current partner, B prime. So presumably, if you have an unstable pair, then these, then, then, then A and B, irrespectively of A prime and B prime, will, will just kind of divorce their, their current partners and run off and marry each other. And that makes the, the, the matching scheme here unstable. Okay, and, and, and it's stable if there do not exist any unstable pairs. So Gill and Shepley back in the 60s showed that no matter the preference lists of the men and women, you always have stable matchings, uh, perhaps not unique though, but they always exist. Okay, so in our setting, or in our context, I should say, uh, more related to our problem is a slightly different setting. It's a homogeneous setting. So instead of men and women, we just have a homogeneous population, which is the set of points, uh, pi. And the, the preference order, our ranking is just done according to distance where we prefer closer points. 
And uh, the definition of stable matching is, is exactly the same, except that we have this homogeneous population. So uh, what was shown in this paper by uh, Hagstrom, uh, Pimentel, Paris, and Trump is that under the assumptions one up to three that uh, appear up here, uh, there exists a unique stable matching in, in this setting. And moreover, it's generated by a greedy algorithm, uh, which is kind of what you, would, what you would think. So what you do is you just find mutually closest points. So points such that each one is closest to the other. So each one prefers the other over everyone else, and you just match them and remove them from consideration from the set of points and, and just continue iteratively. Okay, so in this example here, how did we reach this matching? Sorry, I lose the pointer sometimes. Uh, so how did we reach this matching? Uh, these two points here, uh, these two points here, <laughs> I'm losing the, what's going on here? Okay, I'll just use my mouse for now. Uh, so these two points right here, they're mutually closest to each other and it's not hard to check that in any stable matching, they have to be matched to each other. Okay, so you, you just, you simply match them and you remove them and you, and you continue. Now you, you have these two, which are mutually closest. You match them, you remove and continue. And if you, Try to imagine what is the relation between this and the and our balloon process. Maybe it'll work here on this side, yes. Uh, well, the balloons are growing at rate one. So this is exactly what this relation, this matching is exactly telling you which balloon collided with which, with which other balloon. Okay, and the fact that this, there exists a, a unique stable matching is exactly telling us that this balloon process is, is indeed well-defined. Uh, so in this paper, they studied, as I said, uh, various types of matching, but uh, I, I won't talk about that. I'll just tell you a bit about what they showed for stable matchings of Poisson point processes. Uh, and instead of telling you this in the in their language, I'll I'll, I'll say it more in, in the language of the of the process that uh, we're talking about here. So they studied the typical matching distance, and and I'll tell you about this in relation to the density of this process pi t, and these are closely related. So a very simple observation is that since the any two points in pi t are a distance at least 2t, right? Because the balloons have radius t and any two which touch pop, the balloons are disjoint. So distances are at least 2t. That immediately tells us that the density is at most one over the volume of a ball of radius t because the balls are disjoint, okay? Which is roughly a constant over t to the d. Um, so just because this was already asked before, I'll uh, just uh, mention quickly whether the density indeed scales like a constant over t to the d, that, that's, that's an open problem. Uh, but it's at most a constant over t to the d. That, that's a step on survey. Remind us what is pi t? Uh, the point process uh, consisting of the centers of balloons active at time t. So those which haven't died yet, just their centers. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, what was shown in this paper is the following proposition uh, in, in the language of, of, of what we defined. So let me remind you again, RT is the distance from the origin to the closest active balloon at time t. Uh, so what they showed is that almost surely the limb inf of RT minus 2T is less or equal than zero. Okay, and in terms of RT over T, this means that the limb inf is at most two. So what does this tell us in terms of the balloons? If, if we think about this more geometrically, it's telling us that the balloons reach halfway to the origin infinitely often, right? Because RT less or equal than T means the balloon reached the origin, Less or equal than 2t just means that it reached halfway to the origin. Okay, so this is almost recurrent, but, but not exactly. It's kind of halfway there. And the interesting thing here is, uh, although they proved this just in RD, the, the ideas are very, um, very soft and they work in, again, in these, any reasonable space, including the hyperbolic plane and the regular tree. Okay, so they, th these ideas can't really be 
um, used to show transients or recurrence. But it's still kind of um, a, a very nice and a, a very good information. And um, yeah, okay, due to lack of time, I'm not going to go into the proof, but, but I'll just say that this uses, as I said, it's very soft and just uses the insertion and deletion tolerance of the point process. So it doesn't really need to be a plus one point process and some ergodicity. Okay. Um, yeah, so now I'd like to go and tell you a bit about the proofs. Um, any, are there any questions? I, I haven't really been looking at the chat. Uh, it's, it's... Well, a, a question that came up is, is there uh, uh, some real process that this is uh, that this is based on. Is it meant to help understand something in the real world, or is it just developed for theoretical purposes? Um, well, there's the children's uh, book that I was mentioning. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, I'm, maybe a good place to look is in, in the plus on matching um, paper by Pimento by Holward, Pimentel, Paris, and Tram. And um, I, I think there's all sorts of uses for the matchings. And as I said, this balloon process is, is essentially just the, the stable matching, but considered kind of from a different point of view. So yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer for that. From, uh, from your, from your point of view, it was just, uh, just interesting for itself. Yes, yes. So can I ask uh, one question? Sure. So I was wondering if there are any connections to to continuous first passage percolations and uh, RT being something like you know sub additive and then you can get almost sure convergence uh, because it seems similar right if I if I uh, if I only pay for distances which are not involved then this relates to RT and then the RT should be something like the asymptotic uh, like the time constant of the continuous. Uh, uh, first passage percolation. Um, yeah, I don't know about any um, any such relation. It's um, good to think about, though. Um, but your question did remind me of something I did want to mention that uh, this process, the way we reached it, is uh, it came as a question by Tai Um and it was motivated by um, some connections with. Um, um, coalescing and annihilating random walks. Um, but as it turns out, the behavior is, is, is kind of different. So, so there you always have recurrence um, also in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, and here, as we see, it's, it's transient. So, so, so there might be some similarities with various types of processes. Um, I don't know about first batch percolation though. So, so for, for instance, if I can ask another question. So, so for instance, if I if you uh, initially dilute the points according to the uh, density of those who are supposed to touch each other, uh, you know, for for time t, do you know if you'll get the same? Uh, and then you condition on not having, uh, you know, two points of the of the of the of this distance. Will you have the but same then, process? But then you run the process. Yeah, I, I don't think that should change a lot because. I mean, what happens at the initial time of the process isn't really, you know, that, that doesn't seem like it should have a big effect. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And Inon, I, I seem to remember that uh, the paper of a uh, tolerant demantle person, Shram, one, um, asked about the question of whether the, what, what is the matching distance? So a point mm -hmm. to origin, close to the origin, how far is it matched? Does your um, proof give any information on that? Um, yeah, so this is, this is what I was saying here. They, they studied the typical matching distance. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So this is what, yeah, so, okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't say the results exactly in their language. Um, yeah. We don't get anything quantitative. <laughs> You'll see yeah. in a moment okay. when I tell you about sure. the proof. Very yeah, we, we don't know much in some sense, and we were kind of lucky that we were able to answer the questions. Excellent. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, so in RD, uh, so as I, as I said, this proposition is, is very nice and applies um, in, in kind of any reasonable space. So on the one hand, it seems like it can't be used to, to prove recurrence um, or transients, because in some cases it's recurrence, in some cases it's transients, and 
the proposition just holds always, but actually in RD, it, it is the main input. Um, and and the, the proof of this also is, is as I said, very, um, very soft and non-quantitative. Okay, so let, let me tell you about this. So let's define uh, T sub X to be the um, time at which the balloon uh, at point X pops. Okay, and, and if X is not uh, part of, is not in the initial uh, point process, then T of X is just zero. Okay, so it's, it's the time until it pops, or in other words, it's radius at the time when it pops. Okay, these are, that's the same thing. So the proposition that I just mentioned uh, tells us uh, that uh, the limp soup of Tx over norm of x is at least one half almost surely, right? Because we said that balloons reach halfway to the origin infinitely often. So that means you have infinitely many x's such that they're alive at time x and their distance is, um, it, to the origin is, is less than 2t. Okay, so that, 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 that's our initial input. And now we're going to apply this, um, this very classical looking um, and general result, just um, which says the following thing. If you have any stationary process indexed by ZD, uh, then the limb soup of Xn over norm of N is either zero or infinite. It can't take non-trivial values. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit about this theorem in a moment. Let's just see how, how this, um, how this um, finishes the proof. Well, well, then uh, we knew that the limb soup was at least a half, so it has to be infinite. And the half told us things reach half the distance. Infinite tells us that it not only reaches all the way, it reaches, as we said, we as close as we want to the center of the origin. So this is exactly that the limit of RT over T is zero. Okay, and strictly speaking, you know, we need to uh, set, we need to apply to a ZD index process. So we split space into cubes, apply to the maximum if we have more than one point in that cube. Okay, but 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 really this is it, and 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 both of the things are um, are soft and non-quantitative. So so let me give you a bit of idea of how to prove this. Or oh, maybe I should say before. Um, this seems like a very classical result. And you know, we, we thought that maybe this is known and we asked some people and uh, Ofer Zaituni um, gave us a reference and this is the only reference we know of, uh, of a work, uh, thesis work by David Tanney where he proves this in, in the one dimensional case uh, using uh, relations with branching processes. Uh, but, the, uh, but his proof doesn't seem to uh, generalize to higher dimension. And also our proof has, has the added advantage um, that it's kind of more direct as well. Okay, so here's, here's the proof idea. So first of all, we can assume that this process is ergodic because um, we just want to show that it's zero or infinite. Um, and now let's suppose that the limb, limb soup is at least some constant A or you're strictly greater than some constant A. So what does this mean? This means that if we're standing at the origin and we place a, a, a tree of height xn at every point n, then if we're looking, if standing at the origin, we look at slope a, then we're gonna see infinitely many uh, treetops above the slope. That, that's what uh, this, this limb soup is saying. And by translation variance, that means that the same thing holds if we stand at any point. Any point we stand at and we look at slope a, we're gonna see infinitely many treetops above that slope. So what we can do is we can place um, at the top of each, um, at the canopy of every tree, we can kind of place a cone with slope A, okay, um, at, every, at every tree. And let's look at the bases of these, um, of these um, cones. So in, in one dimension, these are just intervals. Let's uh, switch to two dimensions and look from the top. So in two dimensions, just looking at the bases of these cones, these are, um, these are disks. And what we know kind of is that every point is covered by infinitely many of these, of these disks. Um, be, because the limb soup is, is, uh, is at least a um, almost sure. So now we can apply Vitali covering lemma, uh, which tells us that we can find a disjoint collection of these disks such that the five time blow up covers everything. 
And, and this means in particular that these, um, that these dark disks uh, shown here, um, because they're disjoint, they have to have a positive proportion, they have to cover a positive proportion of space. And in particular, even if we shrink them down a bit, okay, we take the two times blow down, we shrink them, these uh, centers still cover a positive proportion. But these shrinked cones are exactly the places that if you stand and you look at slope 2a, you're going to see infinite, you're going to see um, uh, treetops above you. So actually, this is going to tell you that the limb soup is at least 2a. And if a was positive, then, then this means that the limb soup is infinite. Okay, so there's a bit of technicalities here that I'm kind of skipping over. To apply Vitali covering lemma, you need to know that the, that the radii are bounded. And also we need to know not just that things are covered once, but that they're covered infinitely often. But these are technicalities and, and this, is, this is really the main idea. At the end, Inon, you say that they cover positive proportions. So it means that you have positive probability that the limb soup is greater than 2a, uh, right? Right, and, but I already assumed ergodicity, right? Because it's enough to prove this for every ergodic um, process. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. okay, so so this is the proof for RD. Just checking how I am on time. Okay, so uh, perhaps the next interesting thing is the hyperbolic plane, but um, maybe that's more interesting than the tree, but, but actually, as we'll see, the, the proofs for the hyperbolic plane, they use uh, the same ideas and actually some of the results I'll talk about for the, for the tree. Okay, so let's talk about that next. So remember the deregular tree is on the one hand the combinatorial discrete structure and the other hand for the balloon process we're imagining it as a continuous space. Uh, but here it's going to be convenient to, um, to, to also think about the combinatorial structure. Um, it, it's not very important but it's convenient. So let's project the, the points the, which are active at time t to the centers of the, uh, to, to the vertices of the tree. Okay, so I'll call that pi tilde t. So pi t again was uh, the points here active at time t and, and pi tilde t are, are, are the projections to the vertices. Projection means you take the vertex, vertex that's closest to you? Yeah, yeah. Just send it to, exactly, send it, project it to the nearest point, nearest vertex. And, and we don't really have to worry about ties because almost surely there are no points in the middle of the edges. Okay, so this, um, this process, uh, this point process for any fixed t, uh, well, first of all, the points in pi t were 2t separated. So after this projection, they're 2t minus 1 separated. And secondly, um, this process is a factor of iid. And again, um, for lack of time, I'm not going to give a precise definition. I hope some of you are familiar with this. Uh, for those who are not, I'll just uh, say in a few words, what this means is that you can construct this process pi tilde t by placing iid variables on the vertices of the tree and then deterministically as a function of those iid variables as an equivariant function kind of in, um, you can construct uh, the process deterministically okay so you can write it as a function of iid variables so here's a question uh, given a process that satisfies these two properties, what is the maximal de density that, that it can have? Okay, if it's 2t minus one separated and it's a factor of iid. And so a trivial bound, which, which in the same spirit that we talked about before, just using the fact that it's 2t minus one separated gives us that, well, the, the, the balls of radius t or t minus a half are disjoint. Uh, so this gives us a bound of the, of the form, uh, some constant over d to the minus one to the power t. Okay, but this really just uses the fact that it's two t minus one separated. And, and it's easy to find, uh, to saturate this bound if you just want a collection of points in the tree, which is two t minus one separated. Okay, so, so this really is tight if you just use the first property. But the fact that it has to be constructed in an invariant way as a function of iid variables, allows us to um, improve this uh, quite a bit, essentially to one over the volume of a ball radius 2t, okay, up to this um, 
up to this factor of t here in the numerator. Uh, so this is based on, well, maybe I should say first that, that, this, that these types of results um, for independent sets, which is the case of t equals one or t equals two, like one or two separated, just where the distance between points um, where you can't have adjacent points on the tree, independent set. Um, so in the kind of the discrete uh, finite case in, in regular graphs was studied by Bolovash and McKay and Raman and Virag have a, a nice recent work uh, where they uh, consider this on the regular tree. And one other thing I'll mention here, which will be important later when we talk about the uh, hyperbolic plane. Uh, anyways, I didn't give a precise definition of this notion of factor of IID, but for the theorem, for the statement to hold, it's enough to, to, to look at the, weak, the weakest kind of notion where we just need the function of the IID to be invariant to some transitive group of automorphisms, not necessarily all of the automorphisms of the tree. So let me quickly give you an idea about how to prove this. Uh, so first of all, we approximate the factor map by, by a so-called block factor, which just means a finite range map. So this is a map which really just looks at finitely many variables um, around every vertex. So say distance 100 around the vertex, you look at the ball, you look at all the IID values there and you have some algorithm. And this is closely related to local algorithms, uh, which, which determines whether that vertex belongs or does not belong to, to the output process. Uh, then we use the fact that random deregular graphs converge locally to the regular tree. Uh, and more precisely, in order to obtain this um, a slightly stronger invariance property, we need that a certain colored configuration model converges locally to a, a colored version of the tree. Uh, but this is the same type of idea as, as um, perhaps this more standard convergence. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to pull the, the, the block factor map from the infinite tree and apply it in the, to the finite graph. Since, uh, since finite balls in, the, in, a, in a deregular graph are, are typically tree-like, we can just apply the same algorithm, the same local function on the finite graph. And this leaves us just with the task of bounding the size of the largest 2T separated set in a finite uh, random regular graph. And this can already be done by combinatorial methods, just kind of by direct counting, um, giving a, a, a good, tight bound on the probability that uh, a fixed set of size um, of, of, some, of, of some size is, is actually uh, 2T separated and then just applying a, a union bound. So actually this bound applies for a class of processes which is much, uh, much bigger than just the factor of IID, right? It's... Uh, how, how much bigger? What do you mean? Like, uh, I mean, in a sense, to any, uh, you know, sophic process, right? in a sense, like any, anything that has, oh. let's say, yeah, let, let me say something uh, weaker, it's, it's a positive sophic entropy, something like that. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think, I think we do use somehow that it is a factor of ID because when you uh, use this convert this local convergence, you also want to know that um, if you put IID variables on the finite graph, then with the the marks on the on the vertices that converges locally to the tree with IID variables. So you need that that convergence to hold together with the mark. I think that's sort of the, the what's uh, behind the definition of the Sophic entropy. Okay, yes, maybe. Yeah, it's kind of like unimodular. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Right, good point. Um, yeah, again, as I said, even like, like with RD, the proof here is, is again kind of soft. I mean, we have this quantitative bound, but we don't really investigate the, the, the balloon process directly in some sense. Okay, so let me now show you how to, to, to get the, let's go back to the balloons. So we applied this theorem to the uh, projected uh, centers of balloons to the vertices. This tells us that the density is at most uh, constant T over D to the minus one to the power two T. 
And now we simply apply a union bound on, on large balls, which are almost of, of radius 2t, 2t two two minus some constant log t. And just by a union bound, we get that the probability is at most one over t squared that, that we have an active center in that ball. Okay, just by taking a lot, large constant log t. Okay, so now borel cantelli applied to integer times t, and then using monotonicity of rt tells us that almost surely rt is at least 2t minus some large constant log t. And in particular, the limit of rt over t is at least 2, and we already saw that it's at most 2 um, in any reasonable space, and, and so we get equals 2 here. Okay, so, so again, in this sense, we don't have a lot of quantitative, quantitative information on, on the balloon process itself. And we kind of got lucky that we were able to, 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 to prove this. Um, so, Ilan, uh, just yeah. uh, following up on the previous question, do you think that uh, the same behavior will hold for any non immutable stuff? Okay, so. So that's a question. Um, it, it, I, I, I think so, you know, non-amenable and transitive, say. Like, um, an, a, a nice yes, certainly thing. transitive. Yeah, transitive. It might, it might even be, I mean, looking at the proof here and remembering the proof in RD, it might even be that it's more of a volume growth issue even, you know, maybe, maybe, so, so for so example, if you were to do it on the lamp lighter group, you expect that uh, you won't have the same result. Yeah, so I, I don't know really if it's a volume growth or amenability, but but I would say if it's non-amenable, that should be enough to be transient, but it, it's just a guess at this point. Um, and and so have... the lamp lighter group, you don't really know? No. no. Yeah. Yeah, as I said, we, we got lucky in a lot of things here. Um, yeah. Okay, so in time remaining, uh, how much time do I have left? Okay. Um, oh, okay, I don't have much time left, right. So, so maybe I'll just quickly give you some idea about um, what happens in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, so the basic idea that um, approach is kind of the same as for the tree. We want to bound the density of, of pi t, get a, a sufficient bound that we can just do a union bound and, um, and borel cantelli uh, The main idea here is to approximate it by a three regular tree. Okay, so we have this very nice regular embedding of, of the three regular tree where um, with these ideal triangle. The problem here, however, is that if we just simply now project points to the tree, to the vertices of the tree, we're going to have unbounded distortion since these triangles have uh, infinite diameter. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the caps near the cusps, these white, these um, bright areas here. Uh, it doesn't matter exactly how we do it. Uh, there's, there's actually a lot of freedom here, but, but, but say, okay, so, so you remove some caps near the cusps. And this is going to give you a bounded distortion in the sense that the remaining points um, after we remove those, um, those uh, caps, the distance in the hyperbolic plane is at most some constant, the distance uh, in the tree plus another constant. Uh, this constant C is not going to be so important. Uh, this A is, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now we can project the, um, the remaining points to the vertices of the tree, we get a set which is two times t minus c over a separated, just using this uh, bounded distortion. And it's also a factor of iid. Now it's only equivariant, not to all the automorphisms like it was in the tree, but only to the automorphisms that come from Mobius maps, from isometries of the hyperbolic plane, but those still act transitively on, on, the, on this embedding of the tree. So that's enough for us. So we can imply the theorem that I, I talked about before to get this bound on the density. Two is just uh, three minus one, the degree minus one. Um, and now we apply Markov and borel cantelli and we get just from this two over A and two here that the limb inf is at almost surely at least two log two over A. Okay, just, just from comparing uh, this bound to the, um, to the growth, the rate of growth of the of balls in, in the hyperbolic plane. 
Okay, now we need to know what this A is. And, and specifically, we need to know that it's less than two log two because we want the limit to be greater than one. And here there's a few choices. Um, so one choice that you can do uh, to, to have this uh, inequality is you can just take A to be the length, the hyperbolic length of, of an edge in, in this embedding of the tree. Um, and this you can compute that's log three. So that gives you this bound 1.26, which is already enough to show transients. But you can do a bit better if you take the average distance between uh, not consecutive, not adjacent pairs, but the nearest, next nearest neighbor. So the, the hyperbolic distance from here to here, uh, this is going to give us the 1.44. Uh, and actually, you can't really improve this. Um, you know, you can't now try to take the distance between, you know, distance four vertices on the tree, because actually, if you do that, uh, the, these actually lie on, on, on a geodesic in the hyperbolic plane. So you're not going to improve this bound. Um, so, so this is kind of the best we can do with this method. And we're inherently losing something by this approximation. And we expect that probably in the hyperbolic plane, the limit is indeed two and not just at least 1.44. Um, yeah, but this is, uh, this is what we can do. And, and maybe I'll, I'll leave you here with some open problems uh, which you can take a look at. Um, and I, I, I hope you enjoyed these balloons. Thank you very much, Inun. Thank you for a very nice talk. Thank you. Any additional questions? Um, yes, I had, I had one question. Uh, for this theorem about the zero, um, zero one law, where it's either infinity or zero for this yeah. xn over n, um, yeah. right? So I, I guess there's no conditions on the one dimensional marginals telling you which way it is, because otherwise you would have mentioned it. I mean, I guess one direction is easy. Some moment condition should tell you it's zero. But I guess there's no nice, necessary, and sufficient condition on the one-dimensional marginals. No, it doesn't seem that there is. Um, um, so of course, if, if maybe an instructive thing to, to consider is if xn is iid, right? If this, these are just iid variables, then the limit is zero or infinity according to um, according to the, the expectation. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but in general, uh, you can have Right, so if the expectation is finite, then it, it's zero, but you can have infinite expectation and still and still it's zero. So um, yeah, we don't have, we don't know of any condition like that. I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't really expect something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, by the way, if anyone has a reference for this, if, if this is a, a known result, uh, I'd be happy to hear. So, you know, if I remember correctly, did you say that uh, this is not true for other groups uh, or some, yeah? Yeah, so for example, on the tree, this cannot be true. Like, if it, like, would, if it like, was true, then, well. Then okay, you would so, have the, uh, right, right. Yeah, so two, two counter examples. One is the balloon process. You know, if you look at uh, this uh, process of TXs that you get, but that's kind of a hard proof. Actually on the tree, it's just easy to see if you take IID exponential variables, Sure. Um, they they have a limb soup which is non-trivial. Right. So uh, this example would work also for any group with exponential growth, right? Uh, the, this counter example, yes. This counter example. Yes. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you and have that's probably why growth, you're saying that uh, maybe the growth of the group is what is uh, playing the role rather than the ability. Yeah, and more than that, uh, this proof uh, for RD, really, really all we use, really all this uses is, um, is uh, volume doubling, essentially, right? Because really all we're using, I mean, Vitaly covering level is, is, works in any space. So really all we used is that once we, um, once we shrink these to half the size, that we didn't lose much of, uh, much of the space. We still have a positive proportion. Um, hi, I, I want to ask you again about the uh, definition of the uh, model there has like two interesting conditions. One is uh, uh, you don't have uh, equal distance uh, 
on different pairs of the point for the inertial points, which I'm wondering why uh, that's like a, must be a, some uh, important condition to have to have. Like, uh, because you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned there was a uh, old result says that no matter about the preference, uh, you always have this, uh, what you call the stable matching, but then on your, in your definition, you need extra uh, conditions so that you will have some stable matching for this balloon process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're talking about these conditions, right? Yes, yes. Okay, especially so two, which is not that obvious to me, I don't know. So first of all, these are only sufficient conditions. I'm not saying they're necessary. Uh, and secondly, the second condition, uh, you can weaken it a bit. You don't need to talk about um, about just any pairs. It's enough that that if you take triplets, then uh, then then these two are not equal to each other. Um, but uh, yeah, these are simple conditions which hold. And usually, typically, you know, Poisson point process satisfies. So um, so I wasn't too uh, careful with this. Uh, but yeah, you can weaken them a bit. Um, okay, okay, thanks. But, but, but maybe I'll, I'll just add, the reason that you don't want them to be equal is that uh, you know, if the, now when the balls start growing, then you're going to have uh, two collisions occurring simultaneously. And, and so you need to decide what to do, either break ties arbitrarily or you know, decide that all three of them collided at the same time, but we don't, we don't want that. So that's why we assume that uh, the distances are, there are no equal distances. Okay. You know, there's a remark in the chat by uh, John Aronson, if you want to agree. Uh, yeah, I, I was told I should maybe ask John about this. So, um, okay, thanks, John. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah uh, one, there, there's a lot of nice questions. I think here, uh, there's a lot of variance to the question that you can look at. I think this is one nice one as well. Um, so if you allow the, some of the balloons don't grow at all, they just stay deflated. You kind of think of them as pins. So still when any, when any two balloons touch each other, they pop, but also when any balloon hits a pin, which is just a balloon which is not growing, they both pop and disappear. Um, and this seems to perhaps change some, some things. We don't know. But if you consider, uh constant growth rate, but plus random fluctuations. Uh, should your result, so, so do your techniques just follow? What do you mean constant growth rate plus random fluctuations? So the expectation is T, but uh, you know, some small fluctuation around it. Ah, okay. So they're not growing at a cost. Right. So maybe exponential, Lost you. Did we lose our speaker? Hang on, can you hear? What happens when you ask a bad question? <laughs> you, lose... <laughs> you lose the speaker. Uh, connection was okay up till now, so I uh, let, let's wait a minute and see if he. If he catches up. He ran away. <laughs> it seems to be <laughs> an internet problem. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'll be waiting for Inon, but anybody else that uh, wants to be going, then thank you for participating and uh, stay tuned for the next Jeep seminar. Stop the recording. <laughs>